Welcome to the Speak to Me series. I'm Marta Kuzma, and I'm the Dean and Professor here at the Yale School of Art. And it was together with Claudia Rankin and Leah Miracor um, that I started this series some months ago in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And uh, it, it took a, a kind of a rest for a few weeks, and now we're back this autumn with tonight's guest. I would like to thank my colleagues, Eddie Dye and Willis Kindery, as well as Lindsay Mancini, who will help mediate tonight's discussions. I had the opportunity to be introduced to Jerome Ellis by Claudia Rankin by way of his New Year's Day engagement at the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church in New York City. So as we near the end of what has been a really most challenging year on this last full moon of the year, which is a lunar eclipse, be it rained in, uh, it feels a most appropriate time to listen to Jerome Ellis in a year that was for many of us um, one that gave form to interruption and was an abrupt severing from where we had been on January 1st, 2020, and what we have faced in terms of loss and isolation. So Jerome Ellis is by self-definition a stuttering Afro-Caribbean composer, performer and writer who explores blackness, music, and disabled speech as forces of refusal and healing. In focusing on oral storytelling and interrelations between accepted speech, cadence, and stoppage, Jerome's work has been heard at Lincoln Center, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, as noted before in the Poetry Project, Soho Rep, and on This American Life. He is a 2019 McDowell Colony Fellow, a 2015 Fulbright Fellow, and currently a writer in residence at the Lincoln Center Theater. Jerome collaborates with James Harrison Monaco as James and Jerome, or Jerome and James. Their recent work explores themes of border crossing and translation through music-driven narratives. They've received commissions from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Arts Nova. So Jerome takes part in Speak to Me series as an additional engagement to diving into the rec, re-engaging critical practice, which is a course attended by our first year MFA graduate students, and one that has departed for its four years, 55 years of realization from Adrian Rich's poetic voyage of imagining or fathoming what it is to have collective consciousness, to embody intersubjectivity and empathy versus individuation. And this course has included incredible speakers this semester uh, in terms of enlightening us. Um, Hortense Spillers, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, Fumio Kiji, Gerald Torres, Ariella Azale, Angela Davis, Cameron Rowland, Naeem Mohaiman, and Harsha Valia. So this semester, which has been an extraordinary journey, culminates in tonight's presentation, referred to by Jerome as On Fugitive Speech, and working through it as a rehearsal rather than a performance. As a trained musician, Ellis has worked through improvisation 
and relates to Saidiya Hartman's ideas around waywardness as the making of something out of a constrained and restricted space, a making of art out of a life of extreme desperation, and by referring to what Hartman has called the plasticity of blackness to afford important interpretations to everyday practices rather than to rely on what has already been conscripted. Jerome also rides on Fred Moten's fugitivity as that rests on the writings of Nathaniel Mackey and further rests upon the writings of Amir Biraka, those around a saxophonist who slides away from the proposed, from the line laid down and that which may be played out in sound. Welcome this evening, Jerome, and we will open to questions at the conclusion, and thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, Marta, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, I was taking notes on your introduction. <laughs> wonderful. Um, thank you so much, and thank you, um, Eddie and Willis, Lindsay and Beth, um, for, Yes, having me, inviting me, I feel very honored to be um, in the presence of everyone here. And thank you for everyone for joining. And I, I encourage you to turn on your camera. I like to see people, but there's no pressure. Um, and, um, <laughs> oh, so nice. Yay. Uh, so I'll begin with um, a poem or at, rather, I'm an excerpt from a, a long poem. What was first? Burn or scar? What was carrying him and what was he carrying? What was first, law or free? New carrying old, old carrying new, Negro carrying new. the new new the law shall scar the free thomas forbid negro from carrying the new away from Thomas, what was first, speaks or stutters? What was first, vessels or masters? May, may my, May my me, may my me be, may my me be away, may my me be away from may the law free the law from the law.
May the law free the law from the law. Burn me away from, from free from he having been a burn and a scar, the short, the large. Free me from free, free, free from law. Stutters are Vessels. So I'll begin with a quote from Portland Spillers, which, as you all heard, Marta say, um, was one of the guests in Diving in the Wreck in the course earlier this fall. diving into the wreck. She writes, slavery, as far as I am able to understand it, offers an analogous spectacle of successive displacements, in which case nothing is what it appears to be. Little or nothing is called by its name, precisely because the institutional order and its inhabitants on either side of the question, while the sides here are not moral equivalents, are trying intolerably to square a circle or not to notice, like the Miltonic legions, that they are trying to assure their oxygen supply of the social upside down. But the mandate here was to try to stand up this anarchically inverted arrangement of the social in order to hear it stutter more clearly. And when she says uh, the, the mandate here, she's referring to um, her essay, um, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, and, and referring to what, what, what what she was trying to do in that essay. Uh, this quote is from the introduction to um, Black, White, and in Color, her collection of essays. I'll read it one more time. Slavery, as far as I am able to understand it, offers an analogous spectacle of successive Placements, in which case nothing is what it appears to be. Little or nothing is called by its name, precisely because the institutional order and its inhabitants on either side of the question, while the sides here are not moral equivalents, are trying intolerably to square a circle or not to notice, like the Miltonic legions, that they are trying to assure their oxygen supply of the social upside down. But the mandate here was to try to stand up this anarchically in inverted arrangement of the social in order to hear it stutter more clearly. And I, I start with this quote because I, um, for a few reasons. One, because Spillers um, <clears throat> is a part of, of the syllabus for the course, I want to be in conversation with her. And I also want to explicitly um, acknowledge my debt to her work and to other, other black and brown female and feminist scholars whose work I think um, continues to go um, ignored and unsighted too often, in including um, at times in my own work. So I am explicitly acknowledging um, their intellectual labor, 
Um, and including here where I'm in this talk trying to find some points of contact between Black studies and disability studies. And in that effort, I have I have been I am also indebted to scholars like like scholars like Tree Pickens and Nirmala. And thirdly, I, I start with this because I find her call to hear a stutter more, more clearly to be very, um, a very generative um, idea for me. Um, and what she's referring to here has to do with, or rather the, the comparison she's drawing is that in a sense, slavery as an institution has a stutter and what and what more specifically she's referring to earlier um, in this passage is that the idea that a person could be a person could be property that there is an idea called person there's an idea called property and that they could somehow be equated or brought together that there is something about that that has a stutter and for her there's something about that that is inverted. So I will try to uh, listen to certain forms of stutter more clearly. And perhaps um, within that search for clarity, we'll find a um, new form of, of um, obscurity. Um, so I, I consider these remarks um, to be a preliminary and fragmented attempt to respond to the um, syllabus of Diving Into the Wreck. Uh, there's, the syllabus has a call for, quote, new languages and expanded vocabularies of expression from the arts in our constructions and propositions for new modes of sexual, biological, political, and creative agency, a, a close quote. So I'm trying to take uh, the stutter itself as a form of critique um, and embodied embodied critique. And at least in my case, <clears throat> a critique that is inseparable from the fact that I don't have control over, over the appearance of the stutter, that there to me is something about its embodiedness and the form of critique it takes that, that in some ways excludes excludes my choice. Um, I think about what um, what what the, what the philosopher uh, Simone Weil once wrote about obstacles, which is that like an obstacle is not something that you can place in front of you. An obstacle has to be has to be out of out of your control. And so I asked, what does the stutter itself critique? I would say the regime of fluency, which demands that human speech be efficient and smooth and optimized like a well-oiled machine which is co-opted and controlled by 
capitalist ideologies that privilege production and efficiency. And here I am also indebted, indebted to indebted to Joshua St. Pierre. The the disabilities studies scholar who himself is a a stutterer. And so if, if speech takes time and time is money, then stuttered speech is a loss of money, is a waste and is a lapse in productivity. So further, I would argue that the stutter is fundamentally a critique of time, more specifically of capitalist time and the intimately related white supremacist Hetero, hetero patriarchal time orders that are interwoven with it. And one of the modes of, of critique that I think the stutter itself practices has to has to do has to do with with fugitivity. And as as Marta said, I I hear him am indebted to Fred Moten's um, expansive understanding of fugitivity, of escape. Um, he writes, what's at stake is fugitive movement in and out of the frame, bar, or whatever externally imposed social logic, a movement of escape in and from pursuit the stealth of the, of the stolen that can be said since it inheres in every closed circle to break every enclosure. A close quote. I sometimes describe how it feels when I'm stuttering that, that I, 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 I go out uh, the back door of, of time is how it feels. It feels both that my voice escapes, but that I also escape with it um, to where I don't know. The stealth of the stolen stitches itself through patches of shadow, pithy movements, mosquito thoughts, Tracks covered and uncovered, hollow footprints on the plane of the spirit, pith of the spirit clothed in shadow. You hunt yourselves along new lines. They pursued you through the stave. How did you stave them off? Come fathom. Thy prerogative is to fathom, fricative circuit. The pursued is also pursuing something. They pursue you while you pursue something else, but in the end, all you are you all pursuing the same thing. Fugitivity then is asymptote. I'll quote um, the white historian Eugene
Eugene Genovese. He writes, during the 18th and 19th centuries, advertisements for runaways often referred to slaves who stuttered and had a downcast look, or specifically to those who spoke haltingly to white men. Historians have interpreted these data as evidence of anxiety or fear, yet these slaves being runaways suggest something more, as does the occasional evidence of stuttering among impertinent house slaves, independent-minded and spirited mechanics, and others who clearly did not qualify as weaklings or toms. And significantly, modern Black blues singers often use a calculated stutter to convey emotions they regard as too intense for words. The stuttering, stammering, and downcast looks before white men betrayed not only fear but smoldering anger and resentment. Their occurrence among runaways also lends some support to recent theories that associate stuttering with a sense of isolation, with fathers vague or distant, with domineering mothers, and with an inability to cope with authority. Recent psychological researches cannot be projected back in an attempt to construct a depth psychology of strangers long since dead. But these researches do conform in a general way to a perception of many slaves as seething with hostility toward those who commanded the paternalistic relationship in which they found themselves embedded, especially when authority manifested itself in ways that must have seemed arbitrary. Capricious, insensitive, and brutal. Close quote. I am much more agnostic than he is about naming the emotions that are betrayed by the stutters of enslaved people. Stuttering blurs distinctions between voluntary and involuntary. But I do find these advertisements, which appear in 18th and 19th century newspapers, as a very fruitful site for thinking about blackness and stuttering together through thinking about fugitivity. There are hundreds of these ads. Um, from newspapers from the, the UK, the US, the Caribbean, Latin America. And for the past few months I have been, I don't know what the verb is. I was gonna say working with them, but that, that feels not right. I have been um, very simply, very literally sitting in front of them um, every day um, more or less, I, I bring one up on the computer and I copy it down in, on a sheet of paper and I sit with it and I slowly um, begin to rearrange the words and the ads to see what um, new lines may arise from that. And in this, I am indebted to Anne or Bessie Phillip and her book, Zong, where she does something similar with a legal case from the 18th century about um, a massacre of Africans on a slave ship. Uh, stuttering is often hereditary. Um, um, I inherited mine from my mother and um, It is in, for me, the practice of the daily engagement with advertisements is an ancestral practice. Um, especially when I deal with the, ad, with the ads from Jamaica where there is a small, but a, but a very real possibility that I am, that one of the runaways that is is described is a blood relation of mine. Um, 
I will show the ad for the poem that I read at the top is based on this ad, this one here. Um, I'll read it. This is uh, this is from. Um, it's from Virginia, um, where I'm from. Um, uh, King William County, August 20th, I believe, or no, August 24th, 1751, ran away from the subscriber, a short Negro fellow named Stepney. He has a sailor's and Negro's dress, a large scar on his temple, occasioned by a burn, speaks thick and stutters. He may pretend to be a free Negro, having been with me in England, Scotland, Ireland, New and Old Spain, Portugal, and the West Indies. He was my cabin boy at first. Whoever brings him to me shall have two pistols reward besides what the law allows. Thomas Dancy, and be all matters, all masters of vessels are strictly forbid carrying him out of the country. I ask myself, how can, how can the disfluency inherent to these advertisements be preserved? Is fluency being another word for stuttering or any form of of disabled speech? For the ads, they concern disfluent enslaved persons, but the nature of their Of, uh, of 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 their disfluency is itself is fluent. It resists and escapes from intelligibility and knowing, despite historians like, like, like Genefese's attempts to psychologize. And that way, the, the Black stutters that are enshrined in these ads, they themselves escape. And they escaped the categorization of simple terms like stutter or stammer or speech impediment. That we read the ad and we have no idea what, how that, that person's speech manifested. There are, other, there are some ads where it says that the slave stutters when they're afraid or that, or when they are drunk. I can say from my own experience that the experience of stuttering is, in my experience, never transparent, never clear, not even to myself, which I think is a further form of power that 
it resists a prediction, it resists legibility, um, and it resists control. I often begin performances and talks and things with a kind of preface or what I'd like to call a pre-voice. And I often tell people at the very top that I'm Jerome, I speak with a stutter, um, including over Zoom where sometimes it can seem when I'm stuttering, I think it can seem to certain people that the screen has frozen or that there's something wrong with a connection. Um, and I find these um, moments useful and they, they in speech therapy, they were referred to as advertising. And my, my speech therapist instructed me to advertise um, to people when I speak to them so that they know what's going on. And, I, and, I, and when I was in speech therapy, they encouraged me to just do that to random people on the street or on the phone, which I did many times and I found very hard and I found it helped me to um, reduce significantly my, the, shame, the shame that I have always felt about stuttering. And yet I also question and challenge my choice to advertise or disclose the stutter, and I chose not to in this talk. Um, I chose not to do it in, in that way. It can feel like taming the inherent wildness of the stutter by attempting to make it intelligible to other people. And so how do I balance this act of letting the listener into my experience with letting the stutter's inherent resistance to intelligibility um, exist and shine. There are many moments I have as a speaker when the person I'm speaking to is unsure if I have a stutter or not, including over the, over the phone. And I ask, what is the radical potential of that space of uncertainty? There's an openness there you know, if someone is watching me over Zoom and in the moment of the stutter assumes that there's something wrong with the internet and that their assumption is in fact wrong, not that there, there weren't, not that there can't be problems with the internet too. But if their assumption was wrong, is there a value to that moment of being wrong or that, that false assumption? It brings me too into a space of unknowing. Um, and the and the the power and possibility of 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 the space of 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 unknowing. When I'm on the phone and I'm stuttering and the person doesn't know and they ask if I'm still there and then they hang up on me and then I call back but I'm stuttering then at the beginning and I can't say hello and then they hang up on me again. It's frustrating, but also there's something there's something else there um, that I think has to do with, with fugitivity in some way and a critique. And I'll close with another poem from another ad. Um, um, let's see. So I'll show the ad first. Let's see, so many tabs. There we go. Okay, so run away from the subscriber last Monday morning, a Negro girl named Betsy, about 19 years old, had on when she went away, a calico gown and coat is upwards of four feet high, yellow complexion, stutters especially when vexed, full-faced, has a mark on each shoulder about the size of a kernel of coffee and has rings in her ears. She was late the property of Mr. 
Mr. Benjamin Dupre. All persons are forewarned harboring her and captains vessels cautioned against carrying her off at their peril. Five dollars will be paid to anyone delivering her to the master of the workhouse or to Mark Tongues, number 60, day, October 6. What I have eventually started doing is that I, I will start with the ad and then I will look at the entire page of the newspaper. And for a period of eight days, of which I call an, an octave, I will add one, one advertisement into it. And so I, I begin with the advertisement and then, then I, on day two, I added this one right beneath it, John Potter advertising fall and winter goods. And then on day three, I add another one. So I'll read a bit of this one. Late last. Stutters carrying a kernel of morning. Morning rings in their ears. Stutters house years of calico and peril and work. Vessels full of winter. Our stutters empty bottles. Close the window of the well. Is a well a window? Are questions a window? Our stutters a medium for questions. Name of no consequence. Evening of no name. The stutters have stolen the name and glass is empty but full of years. Our questions, stolen bottles with a name written inside. The stutters shall deliver years of stolen time. Each shoulder of each kernel of coffee has a name. Each green morning has a name. Each consequence has a name. Each name has a name written in inside to receive a name is to close a window to have a name is to have lost the time of no name stutters deliver lost information I'll stop there. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> um, and I would love to, yeah, to speak with, if anyone has any questions, I would love to have, um, have a dialogue. You can take your, take your time. <clears throat> so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Emma writes, hello, Jerome, I'm a big fan of your work. I'm a deaf writer and I often write with themes of deafness slash hearing, sound, language, etc. But I find that when I share such writing and I often receive more pity slash sympathy than critical thoughtful reception. How do you change and or make peace with the way that abled audiences engage with your work? Emma, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Yeah, I mean, um, that's 
That's a really great question. I, what comes to mind is, um, a question which is like, what is beyond pity? And what is beyond sympathy? And I'm thinking of the story that, the story, the story that Claudia Rankin, the writer tells about one time she was in a Q and A and there was a, a white man who got up and he, he, I, he essentially asked her like, 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 how can I help you? And she responded, I think something like, um, um, well, I would ask you, how can, how can you help yourself? And he got angry um, and he felt like, I, I think he then maybe said something like, uh, all right, I don't remember what he said, but, but, but he, he, he didn't stop there. I, he got angry and he spoke from anger. But I, your, your question made me think of that because I, my question about that encounter between him and her is like, well, what is beyond, like, wh like what was his, his anger about? And like, what is beyond that? Um, Cause to me, pity and sympathy, like I honor them. And to me, they feel like emotions that are about like, that, that feel similar, like, like how can I help you? Or be beneath that, the, um, I think the ableist, um, ideology that is like oh anybody who who has who has disability is suffering in some way and that that is such an ingrained idea um and pity and sympathy they feel very related to that um as to how i change and make peace with that. I mean, I think I, 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 I try to challenge it. Um, and one way I try to challenge it is by like continuing to imagine the stutter as, as, um, as, um, as, as a, all the words coming into my mind, I feel so, feel so banal, like gift, but, but I, but I have, I'll stick with gift. Uh, not, not gift as in talent, but like a gift that I have been given by the ancestors and that is my do it, duty to steward it. And that there is suffering that comes from it as there is suffering that, that comes from everywhere, but that I, I try to resist that yeah, but, but by offering like more imaginative ways of thinking about it. Um, I wrote down, I was gonna share it in the talk that I didn't end up getting to, but I think it's relevant here, which is, um, a Joshua St. Pierre, uh, the scholar I mentioned earlier, he has this, um, gloss on the story of the Pied Piper. And he says that in some versions of the story of the Pied Piper, there are three children who don't follow the Piper. One um, is physically, 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 uh, physically uh, uh, disabled and can't follow. Um, he can't walk. Another is deaf and can't hear the music, and another is blind and he and he can't he can't go with the children. And he offers that as a you know as, as a subversive reading on on the way ableism works, and that again the, there's like an underpinning assumption of ableism that is like any form.
of disability is um, suffering is something that should be perhaps eugenically removed, you know, is not something that you would ever choose. And the, and, and, you know, the image from the story is that it is in fact those who are disabled who are able to, able to resist something. So yeah, that, that story comes to mind too, but I, I, I think it's a great question, Emma, and I, I support you in your, your continued efforts there. Um, I think it, for, for me, it, it remains an open-ended question. Thank you for it. Brian also asked a question in the chat. He says, how has poetry shaped your perception of stuttering? Also, what are some of the meanings behind Black disfluency? Yeah, Brian, thank you so much. Um, well, poetry, I think, has shaped it in so many ways, one of which is that poetry, to me, um, is a space where language is in somewhat of a liminal space, um, which is how I often feel about stuttering, that I'm on the boundary between speech and silence, and that I, if often to me feels like walking along a, a cliff, um, that I can never, I can never actually fully like relax in fluent speaking. Um, even if I have like, you know, five minutes of where I don't have any, any stutters, I, I feel I am in fact still stuttering. It's just, um, it's not as noticeable or it's not as present, but so to me, poetry lives in a, in a similar um, zone where language is being stretched and made strange in different ways and where where and where that is celebrated um, And I feel that like poetry is always finding new ways of exploring that space. Um, so I, 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 I love reading poetry and hearing it and I love writing it. It helps me, yeah, it helps me. It also, it just like, it feels more just like, oh, this is my experience of language anyway, which is like, I find it very hard to have a linear or, um, or utilitarian relationship with with language because I can't add, 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 adhere to it. And I never have been able to, I've been stuttering ever since I was basically started speaking. So poetry to me, like it feels more reflective of my experience of language in the world. Um, and some of the meanings behind black, a black disfluency. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something that I've, in some ways, been thinking about my whole life, and also only very recently that I think. One thing I think about is that you know, two of the major representations of stuttering in the media in recent years are Biden, um, and. and the King's Speech, that movie. Uh, and both are about, both, both stutterers in those cases are, um, are not just white men, but um, are very, are very, are very, very powerful white men. And I find Biden's um, advocacy for stuttering to be very important. And I found that that movie to be very important. And I recognize that, um, you know, I think there's an experience that I have and that other stutterers who have who are non-white where there's a form of 
of intersectionality going on where, you know, growing up, I didn't, I, I never really thought about how my, um, my marginalization and disenfranchisement as a black person, I never thought that that was related to my experience as a stutterer. I always thought of them as two separate things. And I, um, um, and it was only much later that, that I was able to start to think of them in relationship with each other. My, my thoughts on it are, are, are still very nascent, but I find these advertisements to be a useful space of thinking about what, what, what one might, might mean by by black, by black, by black disfluency. And I would say that in thinking about this, that um, as many scholars and, and writers and artists um, have articulated, blackness is something that exceeds people who are black, you know, that blackness, yeah, blackness is 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 a force or is a a way of being that often coincides with people who are black, but it, but they are not the same thing. And I would say this, I would say the same thing about 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 uh, about a disfluency that disfluency is not restricted to those who speak in a certain way, that I think both are, both are very useful as they are, it is imperative to not erase the very real experiences that, um, that arise from my skin color and my um, way of speaking, but that also I find it's fruitful to you know, to think expansively about blackness um, and its fluency. And I would say finally that one thing that I think they share is a sense of fugitivity, is a sense of, of evading strictures and escaping norms. Yeah, but Stay tuned as I, as I I continue to to think about these things for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> oh, it looks like Marta has a question. Marta, oh yes, and unmute you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have the hand raise technique down. Um, <laughs> It, it's so incredible also on the foundation of this course because um, Fred, Fred Moten speaks about a socialist collective, a socialist critical aesthetic practice. And he speaks about how black studies is not, it goes beyond race, but it is, <laughs> has on the foundation slavery and the experience of that, um, that comes to mind, right? Uh, Erica Hunt comes to mind in terms of uh, oppositional poetics and how it is um, possible to think of the normal kind of ordained conscription of the narrative in order to think of a subjective position of agency. And she conflates two uh, books in that essay. And she conflates Beloved and Toni Morrison's Beloved with Primo Levi's um, Memories of Auschwitz. And it, it's just like sort of this extraordinary 
place of how you can be fictional and non-fictional and how you can be rational and irrational and how the space of modernism has always been about that abbreviation and uprootedness. And it only lasts for a short period of time, right? But that's where the generative moments happen. And we spoke before about like, I wasn't going to get into Beckett, but I guess I can't help but get into Beckett. Because, Go ahead. <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned this really extraordinary point is that it's one thing to put an obstacle before you and Beckett uses it as a device. He uses the stutter and the sort of interruptions of speech as a way to point to despondency and to speak of alienation. And you actually resort to this innate, natural kind of point of your body and and an utterance in order to speak to that um which when you refer back to being in this kind of unsuspected territory of a poetry marathon and then you know there is no premeditated notion of what is coming into and then there's a broken silence in an expansive audience within a culture, and now I'm bringing the cultural aspect, within an American culture, and you said capitalist-oriented culture of efficiency, which is like overcoming you know, notions of disability, is the fact that, that that's a problem in itself. This like ultra, dependency on being free-flowing narrative orator uh that as if you know you know it you are just everyone is natural to it we have pharmaceuticals that help us do that <laughs> it's just like you know there was this film about gloria steinem not being able to read from a you know, without having the text behind it, you know, just being enabled to, to do that and needed training to do that. Whereas if you would go to other cultures, that retraction into thinking and taking the time is just something completely um, unaccepted within American culture. Yeah, I mean, yes, <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, so, so rich, everything you're saying, Marta. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely right. I mean, I, I think about I mean, on 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 the last question of, about black, about black uh, disfluency, it's like I think a lot about you know, you know, you, you know, of course, capitalism is impossible without slavery, and so so it, it, it's so so that's why so many of us go back back to just like working on the assumption that like we still don't really understand all the ways in which slavery is still with us and underpins like to me like this like free flowing and optimized flow of information is in is inseparable from slavery like you read these you read these like diary entries from slave owners and they'll they'll like brag about like oh i got my overseer to get my slaves down to six and a half minutes per bale of hay, of hay you know like and like there's this whole and saint pierre writes right writes about this too that like it's 
that fluency as a, as a as a regime is not just about speaking smoothly. It's about optim, optimal information exchange. Is that you should be able to convey as much information as possible within as short amount of time as as possible. And again, like that is like is inseparable from like. harvesting as much cotton or or cane as as possible and advancing in technology in order to in order to, to make that just happen more and more and more and more and yeah what 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 you're saying about the device i think is so is so true and I I have like a kind of like a a Google Doc that is running that I often forget to add things to, but it's it's whenever I encounter stuttering used as a metaphor in in poetry especially it's, I find it very common. But you know, whether it's like, oh ho the engine stuttered or you know, or my emotions were stuttering in between something or or another, and I, because I find them very fascinating, um, and because I, what I'm very sensitive to is is, you know, what I'm sensitive to is when something becomes a symbol, at the expense of, of the lived experience, because the lived experience is always more complex, than what the symbol might allow as you say with Beckett yeah he uses the stutter as a yeah as a symbol or way of approaching yeah as you said alienation and despondency but even the very fact that he can do that he has control over the metaphor you know is itself one is is itself in some ways a step removed from from me because I'm because I'm using it as as a metaphor too, um, but the difference, of course, is as 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 you said, is like I don't have control over it, and in some ways, it's 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 like in some ways I know it more intimately than he probably. Did. I mean, I mean, he might have had a stutter. Who knows? But if he didn't, I know it more in some ways more intimately than he did. But also, I bet in some ways it's more mysterious to me than it is to him because it's extremely mysterious to me and I, and I live with it every, every, every second. But further, what, 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 what you're saying, I think about how like I, like I still, and, and, in, and in, in the talk this evening, I still had the feeling that like, like when I was stuttering on the name of the historian, I was like, oh, maybe I just skip it because I want to, because I want to, I have all these, you know, I mean, I, did, I have like all these things to say and I didn't, I didn't get to say all, all the things I wrote down. And I was like, no, because there's another truth that lies in like, you will say what, what you will say, but if you stick with the stutter, then something else gets said. Because I, because I could have, I could have done it, and what I've done for many, many years of my life is I could have just avoided the name of the historian. I could have said the white historian Eugene, and then when I felt the stutter coming, because I can usually tell a few words in advance, I could have just not said the name, or I could have made up a name, or whatever. And I've done that, and I still do that in certain certain aspects of life. And so there's a fork in the road that comes, and I'm like, oh, am I going to sit with the stutter for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds? Or am I going to evade it? What happens when I don't evade it is mysterious to me. And on one level, I'm like, oh, I'm wasting my my time. Like, I want to be done by 7.15, so we have time for questions. But am I going to get to this paragraph? And it's like, that's all going on in my mind. But beneath that, I'm like, well, like, also, I could just, like, let let it exist and like it can do its thing um and that to me is like has to do with the obstacle thing that that you were talking about 
that because when Simone Weil is talking about the obstacle, she's talking about it as, in like in like a religious sense too. That like that like like there's an implication I think in what she's saying is that like one can place an obstacle or a limitation or something in front of oneself and then overcome that and that that is valid but it is a, in some ways we the language is not precise enough but say say something that i you know i mean even with with, with these advertisements i restrict myself to to only using the words in the advertisement so i place a limitation but it's not an obstacle because because no one is making me do that but then when you encounter an obstacle, it's like, for her, it's something, it's a spiritual thing. Like, like there's something beyond you that is, is happening. And I, I, yeah, I think that's very, I just think there's, there's a lot there. And on what you were saying about Moden talking about the socialist, socialist. So it, it, it was. Go ahead critical aesthetic practice, which was coming away from the course critical practice, but then he yeah. added on socialist critical aesthetic practice. And which I think it was like the, the, the movement into a personal experience and trying to find a collective consciousness around it and then move beyond the individuation of it. Um, Yeah, and, and so to me, that that also helps me think about, again, that moment when I was studying on the his, historian's name. To me, like, that's a step away from individuation in a way, it, it, the way it feels to me, because it's like, well, I want to say what I want to say, and something is preventing me from saying what I want to say. But in that preventing, something else is happening, and I, my, what I want to do is, 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 um, is like is like the the grasp is like taken away in a, a certain sense and i i find that very useful it helps it helps to like erode my 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 sense of self in a in a, a very a positive way and that I hope, what I want to do is to, is to, yeah, is to like find new ways and remember old ways of, of gathering and of, yeah, resisting uh, the individual. on a fundamental level, please. So I, I don't want to dominate this conversation, but just on, on that, like, you know, how Adrian Piper takes a verse and talks about like ideology as a political confrontation, which is a verse. And then she works through the I, through the we, back to the I. You know, you, you use this really interesting category for your work called temporal displacement. And that was just sort of, because in a way you were, you were positing yourself outside of your identity of self, similar to what Piper does, you know, and just like sort of positing yourself as a work, you know, I don't want to say that like as, as a work of art, but, you know, outside, a subject outside of yourself in order to serve the purpose to bring to the fore another kind of form. So, that's yeah, all yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. So Joshua writes, Dean Kuzma's mention of Beckett made me think of a production of Beckett's Not I, in which the character of Mouth is performed by Jess Tom, who has Tourette's. Mouth's words are partly about not having control of what she says and having the character performed by an actor who could embody that felt revelatory. The show was originally mounted in the UK in 2017 and went up at the Under the Radar Festival this past January. 
At the same time, given the famous restrictiveness of the Beckett estate about how his work can be performed and who can perform it, it was unexpected that Tom was allowed to do her production at all. Can you talk about how disfluency can sometimes be a key to unlock the meaning of canonical literary work? Oh. Uh. I think you thank you so much, Joshua. I saw this production um, and it was yeah it it was was revelatory as as, as you say um, i yeah, I loved it so much, and i I didn't know her work at all um and i didn't know the play um and it's a wonderful question i think one thing i think of is like it's like i think about these these advertisements in the newspapers and um fred moten has a has an essay called the erotics of fugitivity, where he talks about um, the legal scholar Sora Han's reading of a legal case um, of a slave, a slave named Betty, who um, I, uh, in the around the Civil War, I think she was she lived in Tennessee and her masters brought her to um, Massachusetts where she was granted her granted her freedom and um, I think the, a group of of abolitionists had been fighting there for her freedom. And and um, Herman Melville's god or um, father-in-law was 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 the judge and he he granted to her and Betty decided to go back home with her masters and in the eyes of the court but to refuse her freedom. Um, and one of the things that he says in, in, in the essay when reflecting on this case is that, or I might not say this in the essay, he might have said it in a Q&A after reading the essay, now I'm, I'm realizing. But what he says something is like, he says something like that Betty like went ahead in the future and is like waiting for us to meet her there. That like she, she, breaks and escapes from past and present and future. And I think about that in terms of this because, well, I, so then I think about the advertisements because this feeling that I have often when I'm working with the advertisements is that the um, slaveholder who placed the ad, you know, like, like Mark Tongues, and the one that I showed, you know, I assume that what he is thinking is like, my, my, what I think is my property has escaped. I'm going to go place this ad in a newspaper and give a, a description of this person as clear as I can so that she can be identified and caught and brought back to me. End of story. I'm going to pay for that. That's it. And I have this feeling when I'm working with them that it's like, yes, that is true. And that Mark Tongues didn't know what he was writing. Like he did and he didn't. And, and it's this feeling I have when I read Zong that's like, 
M. Nord Bessie Phillip created this whole book of poetry out of this one legal case. And the feeling I have is like that the legal case is the legal case and it is also something else. And that, and that it, it took um, almost 300 years to, for M. Nord Bessie Phillip to come along and show further what it was that was being written. That like these these two, you know, um, these two companies or the the plaintiff. And defendant in 18th century England, what they thought they were doing. And so I think of of that here also in terms of the not I that a thought that I have is like Beckett. Again, like Beckett knew what he was writing, but he didn't know what he was writing like he didn't know. I, I imagine he, he might not have imagined that someone like Jess would one day play that role. And if he, you know, if, if he envisioned someone with Tourette's or who speaks, speaks speaks disfluently, if he envisioned that for the role, you know, I mean, he doesn't write that in the script. But I think of that, I think like that, like, it goes beyond, like, like in this question, how it can be the key to unlocking the, the meaning of 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 canonical literary work, the feeling that I have and the conviction I have is that that the work exceeds the author, whether the work is an advertisement or a legal case or a play that that Beckett was planting a seed that he might he might have thought was was that it was like all done, you know. Again, I mean I, I don't know what, what what he thought, but to me it speaks to the the outside force that that as it feels in my body, the stutter feels like something that is both like intimately mine and also foreign, that it feels like it enters my body. It feels like it's a spirit that it is, again, because I don't have control over it, it feels like something that is separate from me. And so it feels to me like a force in the way that you know, in the way that you read in like ancient mythology, like ancient ancient Greece, where like where like necessity will be a god or you know eros or something, where it feels like this is like a a thing that comes in and possesses you but is not you and is not yours. Um, and so I think about that too, like with, with like literary work that like, you know, I also think of it like, like when you go to an art museum and you see, you know, sculptures from ancient Greece or something and you know, like the arms are knocked off. That's like, it's like the sculptor probably didn't, you know, intend for the arms to come off. But now that the sculpture looks like that, like that, like time is also an an artist. That like time is has a hand in it, and that to me also feels like this. That Beckett is only one of the authors of not I. And again, further, I would say like on that moment that I was talking about earlier. At the barbecue place. You know, to me, there's one way of looking at it that's like, I was stuttering and she helped me. But another way of looking at it is that there was a stutter that happened in, in between us and that we had both inhabited it together. That it came through my body, sure, but that it was occurring in between us, that we entered inside of it and we chose what to do inside of it. Again, like there are many things that could happen. And sometimes when people are brought into the stutter with me, they're 
reaction is to laugh or to um, or to try to escape it, you know. But she just like she just like stayed with me inside of it. Um, and I think um, in the production with Jess, like the way that I I felt in it is that she allowed her her embodiment and her way of speaking to that she invited us into that. She didn't attempt to erase it. And that the text then existed within that, not the other way around, that like her, her disfluency did not exist within the, the text or, you know, both. But it feels to me that like the text So, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, thank you all so much for spending all this time with me. This is so wonderful. Yeah, thank I'm you for not, your questions. I, go, I have so many more questions, but we can take them otherwise. Um, thank you so much. It's been an, an incredible evening. Um, and I appreciate your time and your generosity and everyone's time this evening. Um, I'm sure we could go on <laughs> for a few more hours. Uh, and what I appreciate about this evening is that you are like embodying this this temporal displacement um and it has so many implications um you know like when you're speaking about beckett but i mean it goes beyond that from saint augustine you know it's like kind of like this this notion of like what is self-questioning but you th do it also acknowledging a place of historical trauma and what that means. Um, in any case, thank you so much, Jerome. Um, so if, everyone we can thank, unmute, thank Jerome for tonight. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, everyone.